Hi everyone. We are getting into sonnets, which will be the bulk of what you read for this week. And the originator, one of the originators of the sonnet, is William Shakespeare. He has a particular particular style or form to his sonnet. Preceding Shakespeare was a poet by the name of Petrarch, and his poetry style, the rhyme scheme, and the syllables are slightly different than Shakespeare's. So when we start to understand sonnets in poetry, we have to start to pay attention to syllables and how they are accented. If you've ever seen Shakespeare performed live, you might find that it takes you a little while to get into the language of it. I know that I try to go to at least one Shakespeare play a summer. The Great River Shakespeare Festival up in Winona does a great deal, um, does a great job putting on Shakespeare's plays during the summer. And uh, even though I have studied English for a long time and I've read Shakespeare often, it always takes me 15 to 20 minutes to really find my cadence and understand what's being said back and forth. So that is completely normal. Um, one thing to start paying attention to is where we emphasize syllables. So when we, when we speak, we naturally place an emphasis on certain syllables. And we learn this as we learn language. We learn it by who we're talking to and the tone that we're trying to convey. So when I say my name, Amory, um, I put this, the emphasis on the am. And when I talk about our course name, Introduction to Literature, um, the duction is emphasized and the lit and tur is emphasized in those two titles. So that is something that comes into account more in sonnets because there's a specific number of syllables in each line. And the way that we pronounce syllables can change meaning. So I stood behind the desk. Um, but if I say I stood behind, or she has a nice behind, as you might hear it in other parts of the world, um, even though it's the same word, the meaning changes. So sometimes Shakespeare did that, um, because remember his pieces were meant to be performed aloud, and so something that might look innocuous on the page might have had a, a different meaning when presented to an audience. So when we are talking about meter, we're talking about basically counting syllables. So, for instance, my last name has three, Bo Dolson, and Shakespeare's has two, Shakespeare. And in order to construct his pieces, he had a specific number of syllables per line that he had to fit into it. So it's almost like a puzzle. He was trying to figure out how to express this certain sentiment, but doing it in a very restricted form. When we're talking about iambic pentameter, we are talking about the iams, or the feet, within the sentence, and then the number there are. So penta is five, and meter is meter, so five meters per um, line, basically. So here's an example from Romeo and Juliet, but soft what light through yonder window breaks. So there are but soft what light through yonder window breaks. Ten syllables in that line, and it should be that every other syllable is emphasized. Um, that is the way it is meant to be read. Now, obviously, depending on who's putting it on, it, it might change the inflection or the emphasis, but that was the idea, that it's kind of like a wave being ridden of emphasis, and there are ten syllables per line. So according to this definition, a sonnet is um, a poem that is almost like a song. It is lyrical, and oftentimes sonnets would be sung in the 16th century. Um, often they are 14 lines. That's the standard rule for creating a sonnet. And then it is an unaccented followed by an accented syllable. So 10 syllables per line, and you have unaccent, accent, unaccent, accent. There are two types of sonnets, um, the Petrarchan, who again preceded or was before Shakespeare, and then the English or the Shakespearean sonnet. So Petrarch started it all, and his uh, are easier to rhyme in Italian because he was Italian. His format was a little bit different. He had an octave or eight lines, and then there was a break, and it was a sesta, which is six lines, and the rhyme scheme vary. So it was a, B, B, A, A, B, B, A for that first octave, and then C, D, E, C, D, E, C, D, C, C, D, C, C, D, C, C, D, C, etc. So, 
Um, I think I have given you an example here. You'll see the red is the octave, and then this, the blue is the sestet. And it kind of rhymes, but again, because this is being translated from Italian, the rhyme scheme is not going to be as great as it would be in Italian. Petrarch was alive before Shakespeare, and he wrote a whole bunch of poetry to a woman named Laura. He became Rome's first poet laureate, and um, he influenced people like Geoffrey Chaucer and Mary Shelley. Then we have Shakespeare come along, and Shakespeare being Shakespeare, he takes the Petrarchan sonnet and twists it a little bit. So we still have the lyric nature of the poem, we still have the 14 lines, and it is also still usually in iambic pentameter, but the the way that the poem is broken up is not an octave and a sestet, but rather three quatrains or fours, and then a couplet at the end. And so the rhyme scheme changes as well, and it's better suited to English because we have fewer words in the English language that rhyme as we do in Italian. So an example here again would be this first um, quatrain, is in orange, the second is in green, the third is in blue, and then the couplet is the last two lines, so two, four, four, four. And usually in a Shakespearean sonnet, the shift happens or the moral comes in towards the couplet, so those last two lines are used as a conclusion. Shakespeare, um, born a bit after Petrarch, and you know, for as much as he wrote, for as prolific as he was, we don't know a ton about his personal life. Uh, it is important to note that while he did write not quite as many sonnets as Petrarch, that the first 126 that he wrote were to a friend, presumably a nobleman. There's often a mistake, mistaken assumption that these are written to women because they, they read rather romantically. Um, so take that for whatever you will, whether he uh, had an affection for a friend of his or it was just the way that men expressed themselves during his time. And then when we get to sonnets 127 to 152, the topic of his sonnet switched from the nobleman to a dark lady, whomever that dark lady is. Um, and we can thank Shakespeare for giving us a whole bunch of words that we use today, including courtship, dewdrop, stillborn, blood sucking, etc. So thank you to Shakespeare. And uh, with that, hopefully that will help you get a slightly better understanding with what it means to be a sonnet and how the Petrarchan, which is Italian in origin, is different than the English, which is attributed to Shakespeare. So remember, we're focusing mostly on Shakespearean sonnets for this section this week, and that a sonnet has 10 syllables per line. All of the lines have 10 syllables. Unaccented, accented, that equates to the iambic pentameter rhythm. And then you have three quatrains, so three sets of four sentences, and then a couplet at the end, which is usually where you deliver kind of the heart of the message or where the shift occurs. Happy reading the sonnets. Have a good day.